This Restorative Justice Life is a production of Amplify RJ. Follow us on all social media platforms at Amplify RJ. Sign up for our email list and check out our website at AmplifyRJ.com to stay up to date on everything we have going on. Make sure you're subscribed to this feed on whatever platform you're listening on right now so you don't miss an episode. And finally, we'd love it if you left us a rating and review. It really helps us literally amplify this work. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to This Restorative Justice Life, the podcast that explores how the philosophy, practices, and values of restorative justice apply to our everyday lives. I'm your host, David Ryan Barcega Castro Harris, all five names for the ancestors, and I'm the founder of Amplify RJ. On this podcast, I talk with RJ practitioners, circle keepers, and others doing this work about how this way of being has impacted their lives. Welcome, Dr. Tom. Who are you? Well, thank you for that. You know, uh, I enjoy that question because uh, most people answer by their roles. And uh, so I'm going to answer you in a way that Mari would answer the question, the indigenous people of New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Uh, I am from uh, the Rocky Mountains and uh, the beautiful uh, Poudre River flows out of the mountains right by my home. And uh, I'm privileged to live right at the base of the mountains, which are full of snow right now. And... uh, so that's my place, and that's where I come from. Beautiful. Who are you? I also uh, affiliate with two universities uh, as, as a place, uh, Colorado State University here in the United States and the University of Canterbury in the South Island of New Zealand. Who are you? Oh, I love the fact that I'm... Uh, married, have a wonderful wife, Monica, have children, uh, actually seven children, 13 grandchildren, and a great granddaughter who was born during the pandemic, who I'm looking forward to meeting in person here fairly soon. Mm -hmm. Who are you? My passion in in life is uh, restorative justice. And uh, I have been devoted to this work since the mid 1990s. And uh, uh, I'm just fortunate and privileged to do this work and to uh, see it coming to fruition uh, while I'm still alive and to work with wonderful people that uh, are promoting this work. Who are you? And I, I really enjoy the out of doors. Living here in Colorado is a wonderful place. Uh, so, I spend a lot of time riding my bike year round. Uh, In the winter, I snowshoe and in the summer, I go hiking in the mountains. Uh, And uh, in between times, I'm a keeper of bees and uh, have two hives in my yard, uh, which my wife loves because she's a gardener. So I can, they pollinate all of her beautiful flowers. Mm -hmm. Who are you? I think the the thing about me that uh, uh, might be a a bit surprising, I'm also a member of a monastery and uh, and what's uh, not living in the monastery, but associated with the monastery. So I consider myself a monastic uh, and uh, uh, live that kind of life, but in the community. Mm -hmm. And finally, who are you? I love to write. Uh, I spend a lot of time reflecting. I have multiple journals uh, that I fill, and then I I uh, do a bit of writing based on what I write in the journals, and uh, I enjoy that. I, I've done been writing for years, and uh, most of my writing right now is scholarly, which isn't my favorite writing. I'd rather write poetry and uh, uh, that, that sort of thing, but... Uh, Uh, I'm afraid the work that we're doing calls me to do more scholarly work right now. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tom. We're really excited to have you. Hey, folks. It's Elise, your producer, and I am so excited to welcome Tom Cavanaugh as our guest today. 
Tom Cavanaugh has been involved in research and professional development focused on creating a culture of care in schools based on restorative justice principles and practices, as well as culturally appropriate interactions and relationships for over 20 years. He has created online and face-to-face -face training curriculum and facilitates professional development training, as well as so much more. In this episode, you will hear a conversation about white privilege, about imagining liberation, and about a culture of care. But before we get started, don't forget to check out our summer intensive and all of our workshops that are linked below in the show notes or at amplifyrj.com learn. Thanks for listening and let's get into this episode. It's always good to start with a check-in. So to the fullest extent of the question, or as much as you want to answer, how are you? Well, I, I'm really feeling wonderful. You know, I was thinking on my bike ride just before this about what a wonderful privilege it is uh, to be out of the pandemic or coming out mm -hmm. to be fully vaccinated, particularly at my age when you're vulnerable, mm -hmm. um, to walk into uh, the grocery store, which is what I just did, and not have to wear a mask. And better yet, to not be worried about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I feel greatly relieved and uh, uh, just feeling uh, wonderful about being able to uh, meet people. I, I've actually had students that I've never met in person mm -hmm. that are now graduated. That breaks my heart. I've never had that in my life that I've not met every graduate that I knew in person before they graduated. Uh, that, that was really hard for me. And so now able to meet people in person and to uh, uh, actually have handshakes, have hugs, uh, really means a lot to me. Yeah, we've lost a lot, um, a lot on a large scale, but like things on that micro scale that um, are really important, right? The in-person interactions that, um, are so important to relationship building and to, you know, we, we define this work as being in relationship. So while you can develop relationships um, across screens and, you know, thousands of miles uh, apart, um, there is something that is always missing. Um, I'm going to come back to this in a little bit more depth later, but for the students that you weren't able to uh, meet in person, what were some of the ways that you were able to build relationships and, you know, send them off in a good way um, when you wouldn't have been able to do that in real life face to face? Well, we did the next best thing that I could think of, and that was to uh, uh, meet uh, virtually. And uh, uh, secondly, I, I traded, tried to stay in constant contact with them. However, it was email, texting, virtual meetings, uh, and then uh, uh, several students uh, as part of my work in ethnic studies at Colorado State interned with me in my work in restorative justice education. And so I got to develop a bit more intimate relationship mm -hmm. with the internship. And uh, uh, I have to say they're wonderful. Uh, I don't know if it's because I, I'm, I'm kind of like a grandfather figure to them, but they they stay in touch with me. They want to know how I'm doing and they're telling me how they're doing. I just had an email from uh, one of the students I hadn't heard from in a couple of months who just got her degree. Uh, and she wanted me to know she's doing well. She's happy she's graduated and she's taking the summer off. And I, I just uh, so appreciate that kind of uh, exchange when we can't be in person. Yeah, absolutely. Anything that can build connections, right? Uh, we talk about, oh, I mean, we're going to talk about it in a little bit more, right? Like building a culture of care that starts with the relationships and the connections. Um, absolutely. You know, before you came up with like that, this idea of cultures of care within restorative justice education, uh, you've been doing this work towards equity, towards justice before you knew the word restorative justice. How did this get started for you? Well, actually, with Mari in New Zealand, mm -hmm. and uh, they started uh, informing the Department of Social Services uh, in New Zealand about how uh, the white uh, uh, social workers could work with Mari people, mm -hmm. and because it wasn't going well. And I really liked the fact that the uh, uh, social workers had enough humility to say, we're not doing well. Can you help us? Mm -hmm. 
And so the elders uh, wrote a document called the Daybreak Report. And in that report, they described uh, this meeting for harmony that they had among their families. That meeting was described as the Hui Fakatika, which is uh, uh, the word for a meeting to create harmony in the family. Mm. And actually, uh, uh, that later, uh, that idea became what we call the restorative conference, uh, which is used both in the legal field and in education, uh, and is uh, uh, was my first introduction to restored what we now know as restorative justice. Yeah, and uh, just like a quick Google search, uh, this was in the late '80s, correct? Like late '80s, you're right, and and the report is available online, believe it or not, in English, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it's a lovely report. The elders actually wrote the report, and. Uh, uh, it's, it's really uh, had an impact in New Zealand uh, on their work and uh, uh, in this area. And uh, it is what uh, motivated me to uh, go to New Zealand. And I ended up, of course, being there for about five years. One, uh, we'll link that report in the show notes for folks who want to check that out. Um, you became aware of this report, or I guess, how did you become aware of this report? Because, you know... I pay attention to global news. This wasn't something that the New York Times was covering. You had to be looking for this. What was it that you were looking for? Well, actually, you wouldn't find it in the New York Times. You're absolutely right. I was a volunteer at the Denver Catholic Worker. I'd go on weekends and relieve the staff so they could have a weekend off, and I would take care of the house, mm -hmm. uh, fe feeding the people and kind of, you know, just managing things and so forth. Well, they got a newsletter from New Zealand uh, called From the Catholic Worker in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. That's where I learned about it, not the New Yorker. And uh, the, the little paper I got was an eight and a half by 11 sheet. Mm -hmm. I don't want to make it sound like a, some grand uh, newspaper. Sure. And uh, in it, I read about this work and I went, oh, this is something I want to learn more about. So believe it or not, I wrote to the librarian uh, at the library in Wellington because I knew that was the capital. And I said, look, at, I've been hearing about this. How can I learn more? And the wonderful librarians, librarians are wonderful, by the way. They said, here's how you do that. And they put me in touch uh, with some people. Uh, and that led to my uh, finding out about this report. Yeah. Who were those people? Um, and what did learning about that report move you towards? Well, actually, uh, the one that was the most help was Judge Fred McElray. He was a district court judge and very, uh, uh, what should I say, avid uh, promoter of this work. So uh, I said, I want to learn everything I can about it. But I said, I'm a visual person and I'm having trouble visualizing what this Hui Fakatika looks like. He said, well, I actually can get you a tape. And so he mailed me this tape. We didn't have email as sophisticated as we do today. And so he sent me this tape. However, it was not in the uh, same uh, format that sure. our tapes were. And so I went down to my, back then, you know, we had Blockbuster and so forth. So I went down uh, to the uh, young man there and I said, I don't have a clue, but I want to listen to this tape. And he said, oh, I know how to transfer it uh, so you can uh, watch this tape. And he did. And I watched that tape over and over and over again so I could begin to understand uh, a little bit. Uh, and that was my beginnings of, of learning about this conference. Yeah, this conferencing model of repairing harm, right? Um, That's correct. You took this and, you know, people like Howard Zer, people like yourself, many others, right, have written about this, talked about these ideas um, in the context of the criminal legal system, 
certainly, yes. and they've been uh, moved into schools, right? Uh, we now know that schools replicate so much of what happens within the context of the criminal legal system, both with the disparities in punishment, the racialized disparities, but also the ways that um, just the structures in and of themselves are punitive, are violent, are oppressive. Um, how did you decide that education was the space for you to continue to do this work? Well, it, I actually knew Howard very well at that time, and we had a lot of correspondence. And he said, you know, Tom, we have to get involved in education. What we're doing now is at the bottom of the cliff. We have to start working before it goes. people go over the cliff, mm -hmm. and that's schools. So I uh, helped uh, facilitate a... Uh, colloquium among the leaders of the three branches of government in the state of Colorado. And when we got together, uh, particularly the head of the uh, uh, Department of Justice in juvenile justice said, we've got to go to schools. They are the source of so much of our young people ending up in jail and ending up in prison. And we've got to change things in education. So I said, all right, uh, that gives me my direction. So that uh, motivated me to get my uh, doctorate in education with uh, my specialty being uh, uh, restorative justice. The interesting thing about that is I couldn't find anybody in the United States to uh, uh, actually be my content expert. Mm -hmm. I had to get a uh, Bert Galloway from uh, Ottawa, Canada to be my uh, uh, content expert because I couldn't find one in the United States sure. at that time. And so uh, Bert had family in Colorado, so he uh, was my uh, content expert and uh, that uh, helped me get my doctorate and get started. Howard said, we have to have research uh, backing up what we do. So I, I committed to that and I've worked really uh, uh, ever since to create and uh, develop the research and uh, get it published. Yeah. You know, a lot of the times we think about, uh, I frame my work against white supremacy culture, right? Being worship of the written word, which is the whole point of academia, right? Like, where is it written? Where can you prove it? Um, and that's a really frustrating part of this work, no knowing that this is the way that people were meant to be together in relationship in a good way. And why do we have to go and <laughs> write hundreds and hundreds of pages of papers, hundreds of uh, interviews with folks to, to prove that, you know, humans were meant to be in good relationship with each other. Yeah. You don't need a, an expert to do that. That's for sure. And to know that, uh, the, the uh, one thing we do that is perhaps uh shall I say, the Eurocentric uh, researchers are not too happy with is uh, we use a process called Copapamari, which is a culturally appropriate way of doing research. Uh, and we have done enough of it and gotten published enough to where now it's recognized even by those Eurocentric folks who may not be happy about uh, uh, recognizing it. Uh, and I'll spell that for yeah. you. It's K-A-U-P-A-P-A. M-A-O-R-I, Copapamari. And so my colleagues and I, that's the research uh, approach that we use. And uh, uh, that really uh, tend, takes uh, the Western way of doing research and makes it culturally appropriate based on relationships. The focus is on the relationship with the people you're uh, doing research with. So rather than doing research on people, as, as subjects, you're doing research with people. And rather than focusing on problems, you're focusing on uh, uh, what we call a, a appreciative inquiry, what's going well, and uh, starting from that position. So uh, it really takes that, that uh, uh, academia that you are talking about and kind of uh, uh, uses it to our advantage, I'll put it that way. Uh, and we're to the point uh, uh, where we're, uh, what shall I say? Uh, I don't know if it's always with, with great uh, glee and uh, gee, we're happy to see you, 
but uh, at least uh, getting published in, in those uh, uh, formerly very Eurocentric publications. Yeah, and it's not to say that um, we don't need those things to back us up because we do have to navigate a world that often demands that uh, written word, that proven statistics and all those things, right? But the way that we go about that can be much more humanizing. The, the research is there, and so we don't really need to go into all the statistics about the disparities in discipline and why restorative justice no. works. No, they're so obvious. <laughs> right. <laughs> but like, what were some of the things, I guess, was there anything that was surprising to you in the process of doing that research? Well, before the research, I, I, I tell you that the thing that really motivated me, I was working in the courts as a court reporter mm -hmm. with one of those little machines. And uh, one day I was waiting for court to start and I was standing in the hallway and this huge man, uh, all dressed in black, uh, who turned out to be a jail guard, uh, was walking down the hallway and I heard chains clanging, but I couldn't see the person. It turned out there was a 10 year old boy behind him, mm. manacled and handcuffed and going down the hallway. And I turned to the district attorney who was standing next to me and I said, what did that little boy do so wrong and so bad? And what kind of threat is he to safety that you have to handcuff him and manacle him? He said, well, he stole some candy last night. I said, you know, you failed miserably. If that's the best we can do for a 10 year old child, we failed, totally failed. Mm -hmm. And that was my motivation. I said, we've got to do something better. The second thing that happened is I saw that uh, people of color, I was looking mainly at the juveniles, were vastly uh, overrated or what was overrepresented in the uh, people that were in front of me. And that really motivated me. I was very concerned when I read this uh, paper from New Zealand I told you about, and I went, all right, I think we're on to something here. So that got me started uh, uh, in this work. Uh, yeah, and, and I think about how, you know, the disproportionality, and this was in Colorado, right? This was in Colorado. Right. There aren't that many folks of color in Colorado, right? Um, just like that, there aren't that many Maori left in New Zealand, right? And so, like, when that disproportionality like shows up, it's pretty obvious, right? Um, Absolutely, it is. And interestingly enough, the proportionality of Maori to the general population in New Zealand is almost exactly the, the proportionality of Latinx to white in Colorado. So it was uh, really interesting to me coming back to see that disproportionality was similar. The population was similar. The, the things we are talking about are international. They're not unique to the United States. Right. It's not that um, the United States in... Hmm. We invented a certain uh, a certain kind of racism, right? Rooted in um, we can talk about enslavement, but also like manifest awesome. destiny, right? Um, oh yes, but <laughs> I actually think manifest destiny uh, and slavery go together. It's just another form of manifest destiny, and uh, uh, you're right. Uh, those are the two big uh, issues that we are still living with uh, intergenerationally. Uh, Tomei likes the fact that uh, uh, I talk about uh, Gloria Latz and Billings' work uh, about the uh, uh, educational debt, that when we uh, have a young child of color in school, we're not dealing with a clean slate. That child brings generations of oppression, mm -hmm. generations of colonization with them. And this, uh, and, and, when we see a police officer arresting a young man and to see the reaction, that's what we're dealing with, you know, uh, and people say, well, it's a mental health issue and so forth. Well, you could call it mental health, but it, it's, it's intergenerational, multi-generational uh, trauma that's uh, happened because of this oppression. And uh, 
I think we've got to begin to understand that. Yeah, and you can't re you can't really separate just talking about like, hey, instead of uh, what rule was broken, who did it, and how can you punish them, and moving towards like what happened, who's impacted, and how, and how do we make things right? The who's impacted and how, right? You have to think about like who that person is and all the stories that they're bringing with them, right? Uh, so somebody who has experienced the world. Somebody steals candy from a candy store, right? Um, somebody who experiences the world um, as a white child um, is going to have a very different uh, response to someone who experiences the world as a black child. We can come from like the exact same um, socioeconomic circumstances, grow up in the same neighborhood, but just because of race, right? That That's a totally different story. And so that impact is totally different. And a system that says like, this is what you get for this action is not going to get us there. Uh, and restorative justice helps us think about that, but sometimes it doesn't go far enough. What are some of the ways that you've uh, started to push people um, and started to think about a lot of that work? Well, we, uh, and, and our research supports this, that what you're talking about uh, ends up often being a colorblind approach. It doesn't take culture into account. It, it goes under the mantra that we teach all st students equally. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't mean equitably. And uh, the thing we have to realize, my Mari uh, colleague, uh, Sonia McFarland, was so good about it, pointing out, equity is not about numbers. Equity is about a way of thinking and doing school. So it, it's a way of doing things. And what... So in line with that, what our research has shown that we are not going to change the uh, uh, experiences of children of color in school until we change the culture. Mm. And what we're seeing too often is people introducing restorative practices without changing the culture and expecting changes in the disproportionality. It doesn't happen, and it hasn't happened. Uh, the perfect example is uh, the uh, positive behavior incentive supports mm -hmm. that are so popular in school. If you look at the statistics for the last 15 years that PBIS has been in schools, no change. The disproportionality has not changed. And that's because of that colorblind approach and the same culture that privileges white students. We have to change the culture. That's where I get the most resistance. Well, we like restorative practices, but we're not changing the culture. And I said, well, then you're not going to change the results for your children of color. So will you please inform the parents of your decision and what the outcome is for them and their children? What do you mean? The research is clear. Please inform them that you've made the decision you're going to privilege white children and you're not going to change the culture. Because if you don't, I will. And see, that's the kind of thing. The pandemic, however, has really heightened this awareness and the demands with the defunding police in schools and so forth. So we're seeing, I would say, not a positive uh, we're going to change the culture, but uh, we have to change the culture. And uh, I'm happy. However it happens, I want it to happen. So uh, uh, that's what we see. That's really the, the tough thing for uh, particularly uh, white people to give up their status uh, and their privilege of, of in the schools right now. Yeah, it, it's definitely a power shift. You talk about, uh, we're, we're not quite to the point where we've introduced what restorative justice education, the organization is, but you are working within restorative justice education where your mission is to create a culture of care in schools. How do you define that culture shift? Like, what does a culture of care really mean? Well, I'll tell you, I'm going to open up a document because I just described that this morning. Perfect. So you know how Howard Zare has uh, the principles and values. And uh, in the past, we have uh, described those uh, principles. And, uh, and when you listen to them, they sound good. 
So uh, we took Howard Zare's principles and values and came up with uh, four bullet points to apply to schools. Focus on repairing harm rather than punishing the offender. Include the student voice in the process. Integrate a whole school approach. Incorporate practices and strategies to build social emotional skill. Here's my problem. I don't see equity in there. You could do all four of those things extremely well and leave out equity. So we think those are, are a good start, but to create a culture of care, here's what we suggest uh, as the way uh, uh, to think about it. A culture of care in schools is characterized by non-dominating relationships where adults and children feel a sense of belonging and connectedness, have a culturally safe place for their voices to be heard and are able to be self-determining. That statement is based on my many years of working uh, with people both in New Zealand uh, and in the United States uh, and a lot of uh, thinking and reflection. I think that really is what distinguishes our work uh, and, and how we think of the culture of care. Yeah. And, you know, that system of domination piece, right? I, I don't think people always think of themselves in like having power over. But if you're an adult in a school building, you have power over uh, the young people, whether you think you do or not. Right. And so absolutely. It's like. One, how do we help people become aware? Uh, but two, it's how do we give help people give that power up? How do we help people share that power? Because you know, one of the things that I've experienced over um, over the last six or seven years that I've been doing restorative justice work, but particularly the last year that I've been doing work with Amplify RJ, is that there are people um, who I've connected with all across the world who are actively who actively know this and are actively trying to dismantle these systems and like change the way that they perpetuate these systems. Um, and that's beautiful. And we love that community. They're the people who are listening to this podcast right now. Um, there are also people who are their colleagues who don't have any idea about like the, the power over dynamics and um, get scared when they think about, Oh, what does it mean to give up power? Like, how am I going to get X, Y, Z outcome for my student? How am I going to, in a lot of ways, keep my job <laughs> and other things like, how am I going to control their behavior? What's your response to that? Well, that's very true. And that's part of the issue is the current uh, systems in schools uh, support a status quo, which educators have built a career on, mm -hmm. have succeeded on, have got titles based on. And I come in and I say, I'm going to change your role in the school. No more of this status quo. A good example is your social workers and counselors. In schools, generally, they're the go-to problem solvers. If a child is having any issue, behavior or emotional, send them to the counselor, send them to the social worker. I come in and I say, no, nope. that child is not learning math from you. That child needs to be in the classroom where they're learning. So we, here's what we got to do. First thing is change the, the education system, starting in the universities, from curriculum to learning. Hmm. The key to learning, and Dr. Linda Darling Hammond makes this clear, the key to learning is relationships, teacher-student relationships, not social worker-student. It's not to say that they aren't important, but that's not the key to learning. Most teachers don't know how to build relationships with their students, or they do a, a very poor job of it because they're focused on curriculum. It goes back to what they were taught. I do the teaching and the front office does the uh, uh, discipline. Mm -hmm. That's not correct. Learning involves the whole child. And so what we have to do, because 70% of our teachers are white and female, by the way, but they're white. 
we have to have them realize they're bringing their mindsets into the classroom and they're privileging the white students in their classroom by the very way they teach. And so we have to change it at the classroom level so that children of color feel they belong and are connected and they want to be in school. And we have to quit referring them out to the front office for, on the first instant. Uh, people talk about suspensions and, you know, that's all fine and good. But the key is keeping them in the classroom at where they're learning. That's the real key. Uh, and uh, that's the change in the status quo that is the biggest shift. And uh, we work real hard on that. Uh, we find too many uh, restorative justice practitioners focusing on those people in the front office, training them, not the teachers. We focus on the teachers. Mm. We want the people in the front office to become trainers, not go-to problem solvers. And so uh, it's, it's really hard. I, I've actually had an assistant principal say, we don't want you. You're asking too much. I had a dean of students tell me, I have been here for over 20 years. I won't change. I like being the go-to problem solver and I'm not gonna change. And I said, well, then your results for your children of color will not change. I said, the research is clear and I don't care how good you are at what you do. It simply won't change. Right, I mean, even if they are the most restorative person they can be, right? Um, and all of the students who are the quote unquote problem kids have a good relationship with that person. Um, there are no relationships in the classroom that are like that, right? And so you have teachers coming out um, of those situations where like, okay, I sent this person to the office, they had a restorative process, but it was that process really restorative because the person who caused harm, maybe it's a student, maybe it's a teacher in this instance, like they didn't talk to each other. It was just like, there was something that happened in this office over there. And now you're going to come back into this classroom, maybe with like a written report of what happened and what you're going to do as, you know, your consequence, quote unquote, consequence or quote unquote, restorative agreement. Right. But there was no active participation. There was no vulnerability being shared by the teacher in that situation with the, the other human, right? Not just like the student who's below them, the other human who they're uh, in relationship with every day. And, you know, to that point about how do we get teachers to shift that? I think one of the things I, when I talk to school administrators, it's like, there's all these things that we need to learn. Yes. But what are you going to deprioritize? Right. There are only so many hours in a day. Right. And so as a leader of a school, what are the things that you are going to tell people that like, it's okay if this doesn't get done? Actually, I want you to focus on the relationship building. And that's a hard shift for people. Absolutely. And uh, that's where the research helps us because the research is clear that you can change the results for our children of color by changing the priorities in the classroom and putting relationships first. That administrators pay attention to that. So that's where I use it to our advantage uh, and say, look at what research have you got that your way has changed anything for children of color? You don't. I know you don't because I've seen the data. We do. We have increased graduation rates in our schools 30% in less than five years. You've got nothing like that. I know you don't. So until you can come up with data that equals what we're talking about, I think you better listen. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the flip side of that is like, I know there are quote unquote, uh, I won't even give them that. There are charter, I, I was going to say, quote unquote, progressive, but I won't even give them that. But there are charter schools who say like, you know, we're going to be like extra rigid with our discipline. And that means extra punitive, right? Um, holding yes. people to these highest standards. And they do get increased um, graduation rates. But what are the relationships like in that building? Like, what are you preparing the students to be like? And then who are the students who aren't represented in those graduation numbers because either one, they're not accepted or two, they've been kicked out. <laughs> That's right. They cherry pick their students. And uh, uh, 
they make sure that they get students that, uh, uh, first of all, they can work with, and secondly, are going to be successful. We work with students that are the, the students that come through the front door. They come from uh, uh, the, the uh, low socioeconomic neighborhoods. These schools don't. Uh, they're, they're very picky about who comes in their schools, and uh, uh, so they can look good. The other thing that I worry about from those schools is I'm not so sure how accurate their data is. Sure. Uh, and uh, that bothers me. Uh, I work with a few of those schools, uh, very few. Most of our schools are mainstream, ordinary public schools. And that's where we need to work. Uh, that's where the problems are. That's where the children we're talking about are going to school. And, and the difficulty we have now is not only uh, a racial issue, but even a demographic, because the bulk of our teachers don't live in the same community as the students that they're teaching. Mm -hmm. So they have no clue what kind of community those students are going home to. They maybe have never even shopped in a store in that community or gone to a restaurant in that community. Or, or, or gone to a parade or anything like that. They have no clue what those children are going home to. So they have all kinds of assumptions, many of them deficit assumptions mm -hmm. uh, about these students. They don't even inquire about what they're bringing to the classroom. That kind of gap is, is, is just horrible. And so we really work hard uh, on what we call cultural humility rather than cultural competence. I don't want you to think you can study a book and become culturally competent. Until you've lived in a, in a culture for an extended period of time, until you can speak the language of that culture, and I'm not talking English and, and Spanish kind of, uh, but speak the language of that culture, you don't know it. So take a position of cultural humility. I don't know your culture. Mm -hmm. Will you help me to learn? That's hard for teachers. And we are working really hard to change even uh, education departments in universities from curriculum to learning, from cultural competence to cultural humility. Uh, and you can imagine, talk about systems. That's a tough one. That's a really uh, tough one to change. Yeah, for sure. What I know a lot of liberation work is limited by people's imaginations. Um, yes. What do you imagine that looking like? Well, you know, actually, we have some schools uh, to, to look at. And uh, it's just amazing to me. Uh, but I'm going to tell you a story to tell you the, my answer. I interviewed a teenage Mari girl, and I asked her, what's it like to be Mari in this school? And she answered me, most of the time the lights are out except on Tuesday afternoons. I love metaphors. Mm -hmm. She said, I said, what happens on Tuesday afternoon? She said, that's Kapa Haka practice. That's Mari Performing Arts. What she was telling me that in order to be successful in that school, which she was, I have to park my identity as Mari at the school gate. If I don't, I can't be successful, except during Kapahaka practice. I imagine a school where it's okay, it's safe, to be Mari and to live out being Mari in the school, to speak your language, to dress the way you dress, to, to be in the school Mari. That's the kind of school. I, I think it would be beautiful. I've been in those schools. They're called Kopapa Mari schools. They're, they're fully enculturated. And uh, uh, I just so enjoyed it. I learned so much. Mm. What is? I don't. I don't know why. The only thing I can think of is we're afraid. We're just afraid, and I'm. I'm not sure what we're afraid of, but that's 
all I can come up with. Yeah, I'm curious, you know, in the United States, we are much more diverse, right? We're not just talking about indigenous people. We're talking about people of Asian. <laughs> we can, and don't get me started on how we use Asian to describe 60% of the world's population, but people of Asian descent, right? <laughs> um, but people of African descent, people of uh, South American, uh, Central American, uh, Mexican uh, descent, and people who have European ancestry um, all trying to... Uh, be culturally affirmed in these spaces. You know, one of those groups is getting affirmed all the time. Um, it seems like a lot to like. It seems like a lot to ask people to um, be competent in all of those uh, different ways of knowing, different ways of being. It's a lot easier to be humble and just ask yes. people like, how like how would you like to be affirmed? How would you like to move? And you know, I'm not saying I, I think there's a place to ask a six year old that question, but there's oh, yeah. also places to like ask parents, right? And you know, parents more and more um, are not um, included into what's happening in in the schools, right? Um, like community around the schools are not included in what's happening at the school, right? And so when we're thinking about like, what does it look like to quote unquote implement restorative justice, right? In this space, right? Uh, I talked to folks about, you know, how are you involving all stakeholders? Like first, first and foremost, right? Like how are you modeling this in your interpersonal relationship? That's first, right? But it's, it's top down, it's bottom up, no matter your position in, um, in that ecosystem, it's how are you bringing all the stakeholders to the table? And it's not an overnight process, right? What are the, what, no. what are the ways like here in the in the United States that you've seen that uh, done well, like bringing all those stakeholders together? Well, I think you, the key is relationships and building those relationships. And that's what we do. Uh, my favorite way to do it is with food. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I So what I like to do is have coffee and donuts uh, right at the beginning of school and let the parents know that, you know, if you... Uh, uh, want to come and dr uh, drop your child off and have a cup of coffee with us and a donut, uh, we'd love to meet you. We even have child care available uh, if you have a little one with you and that you would like us to watch. Uh, we just want to get to know you, let you know who we are, what we're doing in the school. Uh, that's all. And that has been just a, a door opener. Uh, you know, I, I have to laugh because... Uh, Generally, uh, later on in the down the line, we want to uh, have a, a conversation with them and uh, learn more in depth. Mm -hmm. But boy, just to sit down, have a cup of coffee and, and uh, a bite to eat, they pour their hearts out to you mm -hmm. uh, about what's going on and about their children and their concerns, because nobody has sat down and, and simply opened the window and said, tell us, what's it like? Uh, for you as a parent to have your child going to this school. Nobody's ever asked them. Right. The first and, communication is like, oh, your kid was late. Uh, your kid got this grade. Your kid yeah. did X, Y, Z thing, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's always negative. So uh, uh, I, I really focus on that relationships, building those relationships uh, I generally won't even do a thing in a school till I've built relationships for at least a couple of months. Our, our, our work in schools is long term. Mm. And uh, most schools that I work with, I'm still working with. Uh, I mean, I mean, I work with huge schools like uh, Brentwood High School in Long Island has 4,800 students in the high school. I work with Right now, a little one-room schoolhouse in Montana. Mm -hmm. They still exist. Mm -hmm. I, I actually am training the teacher who's the same person who's the principal, who's the, the janitor. Uh, every, that's that kind of school. Mm -hmm. This work really is applicable all throughout the country. And... Uh, I think that it's really important that we just stay focused on relationships. If we do that well, that and take that position of cultural humility, uh, we'll go a long ways. 
our article uh, that we published in Equity and Excellence uh, uh, about uh, our work with the uh, Latinx parents and the children uh, really talks about how they were the motivators for our work. Uh, and they, uh, I love to tell the story that the, it was these parents who had not been in the United States very long, who didn't speak English, went out and got a grant. Now, how they did that, I have no idea, but got the grant for the monies for me to train the teachers at Hinckley High School. Mm -hmm. Just baffled me. But it all started with relationships. I had built relationships with them for over a year. And they knew I was in the school. They had seen me. I'd been working there. They knew about the work I was doing. They said, if we go and get the money, will you train the teachers in what you're doing? And frankly, that's what started all this. I was happy just doing research. And they said, no, our teachers need to be trained. They, they, were the, they get the credit. Right, right. Relationships are everything. Relationships, you, yeah. You've you've used uh, corporate language like our work uh, and you know I've mentioned restorative justice education I also have to say um, when I got Amplify RJ off the ground I was very jealous that the URL for restorative justice education is just restorativejustice.com if people want to connect with y'all um, can you talk about the origin of that work as an organization and what you're doing now and how people can connect with you well, after I did this work at uh, Hinckley and other schools wanted this training, uh, I realized that it's easier to work with schools as a nonprofit than it is as a single individual in terms of their uh, payment and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, also, it's a, as a university professor, it's not uncommon to do research through a nonprofit. So that combined very well. I could combine the research and the professional development uh, uh, through that organization. So in 2014, I created the nonprofit. The other big thing for me was my age. I didn't want this work to stop with me. Uh, I wanted it to sustain. We have wonderful people working with us. I am very, very happy uh, that this work will be sustained. One of the key things I learned from Mari is the focus should not be on the person, it should be on the work. Mm -hmm. They call that kopapa. And uh, uh, that is a really important piece. I think too often it's easy for particularly white Americans to say, well, you know, this can't be done by anybody else but me. Uh, I'm that special. That's an interesting thought. Anyway, uh, uh, that doesn't sustain. And this work that we're doing is too important. It has to be sustained. And as, as we can see uh, with the folks in Black Lives Matter and other uh, organizations, you've got to sustain the work for it to have an impact. Just one or two uh, highlights or, or that kind of thing aren't gonna do it. It's that day in and day out persistent work. And so uh, I was happy to uh, create the nonprofit. So there was sustainabilities built in. And uh, we have a wonderful team uh, of people uh, working with us now. And we're just spreading to Colombia, uh, starting our work in Colombia. And uh, before things got so rough in India, we were just ready to launch in <laughs> India. But I'm sure that will happen soon. So all across the states, uh, right, and international. Um, RestorativeJustice.com is, is the place to go to get connected. Of course, on um, Instagram, LinkedIn, I think you've got, uh, yeah, those are your, oh, Facebook as well, right? And we'll have those all linked below. Um, we've come to the time where I'm going to ask you the questions that everybody who comes to this podcast answered uh, answers. Um, define restorative justice. Well, I think uh, when we think of restorative justice, we have to think of it, particularly in schools, in terms of relationships. When we think about it in the legal field, we think of it in terms of an event. What distinguishes our work in schools is the key is to relationships because we live in relationships in the school. So healing 
a broken uh, uh, or, or responding to an event is not the answer in schools. We have to, to look at how we can heal the harm to those relationships so we can feel that sense of connectedness, that sense of belonging, uh, so that uh, we can be part of the school community. Uh, so I, I really come back to relationships. And uh, Howard Zare, uh, many people misunderstood, but he very much emphasized that what restorative justice is about is relationships healing the harm to relationships rather than uh, having a set of uh, rules and punishment. And uh, uh, so on the positive side, it's creating those relationships. And uh, then on the reactive side, it's uh, healing the harm to those relationships. That's our work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, you've been doing this work for, you know, close to 30 years, right? In all that time, what's been like an, oh, shit moment and what did you learn from it well i i probably more than one sure, sure. <laughs> you know, 30 years uh you know and uh i i i don't know that uh i can think of one right hand uh i've had so many wonderful times let me think for a second on that uh well i can tell you the 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 moment that really uh, uh i wondered i thought i was way over my head so I was in New Zealand and uh, this uh, school that I had been working with uh, got a new principal. The Maori community was not happy. Mm. So they asked me to facilitate a conference. I said, are you kidding? I learned from you about restorative justice and you want me to facilitate it? Yes. We think you are the best at this work in our community. So I went to the Komatoa, that's the uh, uh, respected elder male mm -hmm. in, in the Maori community. And I said, uh, what do you think? He said, I think you should do it. But he said, I'm going to sit next to you. I'm going to open the meeting and I'll hand it off to you. That was a great relief to me because up to that point, I thought, I am in way over my head. I, I have no business doing this work. Uh, I don't care if they ask me. I just don't. But once he said, I will sit next to you, I will hand it over to you, uh, and uh, uh, I'll be right there. And, and that's, that's culturally a, a very significant uh, piece. And I've had several of those moments happen to me. Uh, uh, and, and, and they really, you, you wonder sometimes, why am I an old white guy beating the drum of equity? And I say, you know, we're the ones that should be doing it. And the fact that we think that only people of color should be beating the equity drum, we're making a huge mistake. And they didn't create the problem. Why are we saying it's their problem to solve? And we do that with teachers of color all the time. You know, we soon as they come on board, all the, the children of color are your problem. And we burn them out horribly. So I think, I think it is risky. And most of our work is, is really uh, taking a risk. But it's too important not to. You just, we can't keep going. We just can't keep going this way. Yeah. Um, there have been three other white people who have been on this podcast, and that's like semi-intentional. Um, not everybody right. comes to that kind of awareness about like, oh, we're the ones who fucked this up. <laughs> it's our responsibility to change it. And no, like I know, like you as a white person did not own people and enslave people, right? Um, so that's not your problem, but like the perpetuation of the system did like, what was your moment or process series of moments that helped you come to that awareness? Actually, it started very young. Uh, I don't share this story very uh, often, but I grew up in a, uh, uh, small town in Southeast Colorado and the Ku Klux Klan ran the town. Mm -hmm. Now that most, a lot of people say, 
Ku Klux Klan, Colorado? You've got to be kidding. Well, I just yes. watched like the last Klansman movie, so, you know. Well, they ran the state yeah. for a while. Yeah. And uh, Stapleton Airport was uh, named after the, uh, what do they call the head of the Ku Klux the Klan? The Dragon, yeah. Yeah. The Grand, it was named after the Grand Dragon for Colorado, Stapleton Airport. Anyway, uh, there were two groups that the Ku Klux Klan didn't like in my little town. One was Irish Catholics, which is my group, mm -hmm. and the other was the Mexicans. It was so bad in my town that we couldn't open a bank account. My father had to open a credit union in our house in order to uh, do any sort of banking. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing I grew up with, and I became very aware uh, very fast uh, growing up. And thank goodness I had a wonderful father who was uh, an activist. Not, you know, he wasn't a go in the street time activist, but he really uh, uh, was active in changing systems. And uh, uh, that served as a model for me and really helped raise my awareness at a very young age. Yeah. And I think like it's important to understand that it's not just about like white people and white bodies. It's about this idea of an idea of whiteness being supreme dominant, right? Yeah. That excludes and separates everybody else from that. And that's untenable um, long term. That, that's the point. And, and, and I tell my students, I said, it, it, and it's not always skin color, because mm -hmm. back when I was a child, the, the term was WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Mm -hmm. So even though I had light skin, I wasn't Protestant, I wasn't Anglo-Saxon, I was Catholic and I was Celtic. So I didn't fit. Right. And uh, uh, that is important. And, I, and I'd let my ethnic studies students know uh, it's not always about skin color. We got to remember that uh, because, you know, uh, that's important because skin color is very important uh, to, to recognize, but it goes deeper than that. Yeah, for sure. Um, we've talked a lot about schools. We've kind of talked around families and the criminal legal system. I believe restorative justice belongs everywhere. So what is one place or situation, that's not those three, uh, that you wish people really knew this work? Well, I think one of the places that it sounds funny uh, that that it, it, it's not there because it should be obvious is our churches. Mm. And particularly so many of these white people claim to be Christian, yet you go to their churches, you don't hear the term restorative justice. You don't hear this emphasis uh, on relationships like you and I are talking about. And I wonder why, because it seems like if you're really living the life that you propose, you, you say you uh, ascribe to, wouldn't it make sense? You would think, <laughs> you would you think. Would think, you would think. Mm. You get to sit in circle with four people living or dead who are they, and what's the question you ask the circle? Hmm. Wow. Well, uh, so there, I, uh, there is a, a, a Mari, uh, uh, what shall I say, leader uh, that um, was a forerunner of Gandhi, and many people don't know that Gandhi actually looked to Tafiti O Rangimai uh, as an inspiration for his work. So I would love to have Tafiti in the circle. I, as a side note, uh, Mari uh, children know their Faka Papa, their, their heritage back as many as 15 generations. The first time I heard this, this young boy, 15 years old, was reciting his Faka Papa, and he said to Fiddy, and I went, oh my word, I am in front of a descendant of one of my great heroes, Tafiti. 
And so I would like to have Tafiti there for sure. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think a, a couple of other people would be Gandhi himself, uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, those are the people I can think of. Uh, those three. Yeah. And is that the, did you ask me for three? Four. Four. I, I, I would like Howard Sayre there because uh, Howard has always been a, a, a hero of mine and a great colleague. Uh, and the question uh, I would ask them is, I want to learn from you. What can you tell me about how I can create and maintain peaceful relationships? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of times when we look at people like that um, and think about the work that they did corporately, globally, internationally, um, you wonder what it looks like on their interpersonal levels as well. Absolutely. Uh, um, you know, because all, all I know is, well, I shouldn't say all I know, I, I know Howard pretty well. I, I actually have spent a fair amount of time with him. But people like Martin Luther King, just what I've seen, what I've heard, what I've read, I've never met him in person, even though he was alive during my lifetime. Uh, and uh, Gandhi, uh, he was alive when I was very young, but I never met him in person. Uh, and, uh, and of course, Tafiti had long been gone. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. What is one thing, like affirmation or mantra, that you want everyone listening to this podcast to know? The mantra that, that we uh, emphasize in our work is the person is not the problem. The problem is the problem. So often in schools, we can confuse a person's dignity with their behavior. Their personhood is separate from their behavior. We should never confuse the two. We do that largely by labeling children. We use terms like frequent flyer, at risk, tier two, tier three. We've got to stop that. We can never, we don't even, we have no right to ever bring into question a person's dignity, no matter what their behavior is. Their behavior is separate from their dignity. Yeah. And I think that's the mantra that we emphasize the most. Yeah, I had a, I, I co-hosted a workshop with um, the folks at Teaching is Intellectual, uh, Jen and Mira, and they do a lot of work around um, at the, at the intersection of education and disability justice and neurodiversity and even like labels like special needs, right? Like that's mm -hmm. not the problem, right? <laughs> um, like that, that is, um, you know, a service that we're adding and that's the way that we're supporting the student named Jeff or Tony or Brittany or, or Alexis, right? Um, that that student that's who they are yes. and they need this additional support right um that was beautiful thank you well i think the that we need to look at their abilities and not term them in a deficit term mm -hmm. i have a grandson who is labeled as autistic mm -hmm. riley writes books seventh grade mm -hmm. chapters illustrated multiple books a year, over a hundred pages every each book. They're wonderful. Yet he gets classified. Mm -hmm. And I go, well, I haven't got that ability. I didn't have anything close to that in the seventh grade. Why don't we look at their the abilities, what they're bringing to the, to the uh, uh, school community? Uh, rather than looking at how he doesn't fit with this image that we've created, uh, this white uh, privileged uh, image, uh, and we then we classify them as a, a special ed. No, I, I don't agree with that at all. Yeah, 
for sure. This is the second to last question, and you have to help me after the fact. So this is homework, right? Who's one person that I should have on this podcast um, and, you know, make the connection? Well, uh, I am reading a book right now that uh, is relatively new that I'm very impressed. Uh, Restorative Literacies. And I think uh, this person has really done a great job of bridging curriculum with restorative justice because she talks about literacy in the broad scope. Not literacy is learning English, but literacy is being literate, uh, literate in math, literate in science, literate in mm. uh, all kinds of things. She has a real grasp of, of the essence uh, of, of how you uh, bridge and marry and blend uh, together uh, the pedagogy uh, and our work. And uh, this is a, a, actually a, a very a recent uh, book, uh, Teacher College, Teachers College Press uh, published it. Uh, I've been quite impressed. I think she has done a great job uh, and I'm uh, uh, a very impressed. Uh, and so I, I think she'd make an interesting uh, person to have on your podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Can definitely do that reach out. And finally, um, how and where can people support you and your work in the ways you want to be supported? Well, I really uh, would like them to just go to our website uh, and, you know, introduce yourself. Send us an email, introduce yourself, tell us about your interest in the, the work. Let's see if we can build a relationship. One of the things that I do in my organization, people say, can I send you my resume? I say, save your paper, save your time. I'm not interested in resumes. I'm interested in relationships. Uh, and uh, it throws people off in the dominant society, but I, I'm not interested in roles. I'm interested in relationships. So yeah, send me an email. Uh, tell me about yourself um, and we'll go from there. We'll see what happens. Beautiful. And uh, we'll have all of that linked in the show notes. It was so good to have this conversation, Dr. Tom. Uh, very excited uh, to be sharing this with all the people. Uh, very grateful for Tamay uh, for connecting us um, and looking forward to uh, the continued relationship that we get to build. To everyone else, thank you so much for listening. Um, any last words? You were going to say something. Well, I was just going to say thank you. I, I actually uh, do not participate in interviews uh, as a rule. I don't know if Tomei told you no. that. Uh, and I, uh, at her recommendation, uh, I said I would. I'm an incredibly introverted person. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I don't like interviews. I usually have Tomei or somebody else in our organization do the interviews, but I did it for her. The reason I've enjoyed it is because you've asked good questions in terms of thought provoking, deep questions, important questions. Most of the time when I get interviewed, they're so shallow. And uh, uh, I just am not interested. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Thank you for the wonderful interview. Uh, I really enjoyed meeting you and getting to know a little bit about you and the good work you do. Yeah, absolutely. You're putting me in this awkward position where do I leave the part in when you're gassing me up in the rest of the conversation or do I just like keep this for me? But thank you so much, Dr. Tom. Um, to everyone else who's listening, have another interview with another person living this restorative justice life next week. Uh, take care. Till then. Elise here. Thank you so much to Tom for all of the amazing thoughts that you contributed to this episode. One of the many things that really stuck out to me was the relationship between teachers and students. I appreciated the point that Tom brought up that oftentimes in classroom settings, when something goes wrong, students are usually sent to counselors, social workers, administrators, and anything but the teachers who are involved with their everyday life and everyday classroom experience. He pointed out that it is so important for teachers to build relationships with students and not always put that responsibility on someone else so that students can always feel supported in their learning environments. 
in my experience as a student, I find that to be a really important thing, and I wish that that happened in my classrooms, especially as a younger student. Since we can all be teachers and students in some capacity, how do you connect with your learners? I also really appreciated when Tom reflected on his privilege as a white person and emphasized his responsibility in this work. He specified that it is not the job of people of color to be the only ones involved in this work, and I think that is so important. As a person of color myself, I find that really refreshing, and I wish that more white people in my life had that same mindset. I believe that the key to this is to still amplify voices of color and still prioritize stakeholders in these issues, but to also encourage white folks to contribute to the work. As always, thank you so much for listening, and don't forget to check out our summer intensive and other workshops and all the information you need is in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening, and I can't wait to see you next week. Like what you heard? Please subscribe, rate, review, and share this podcast on whatever platform you're using right now. It really helps us further amplify this work. You can also support us by following us on our social platforms, signing up for our email list, rocking our new merch, joining our Patreon, or signing up for a workshop. So many options! Links to everything in the show notes and on our website, amplifyrj.com. Thanks so much for listening. We'll talk to you next week.